is the LDS Church fulfilling prophecy? The Book of Mormon prophesies that during the last days, there will be a great and abominable church who wars with the saints of God. The Book of Mormon specifically speaks to the reader, giving them certain warnings regarding this entity and how to deal with it. Are we seeing prophecy play out? If so, how do we know? And and there's three key points that go into that is what do we need to know from history? What do the scriptures say regarding that history? And did Nephi and Moroni leave us a warning, something that could point our minds to an understanding of what was happening in our day? The apostasy is very, apostasy is very, very important. Uh, Jude 1 through 3, there would be certain men that would qu- creep in unawares, ungodly men in turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God. Isaiah prophesies that these people come near to me with their mouth but their hearts are far from me. And of course, in Peter, it says, but false prophets also arose among the people secretly bringing in destruction and heresies. And LDS gospel principles even teaches that error crept into church doctrine, that the dissolution of the church was complete. And this is what we understand as a great apostasy. And then Paul lamenting when his letters to Timothy says, I cease not to warn everyone night and day. And in Acts, he says he does so with tears. In the last uh, letter that he gives to Timothy, while he is preparing for his own extermination, he's writing about the church that he set up and spent 13 years among in Asia. And this was really sad because he's saying that he spent all that time with them in Asia and already, even before he is dead, the church has already fallen to apostasy because men have come in and changed the doctrine and the people have followed after false gods. And this is very grievous. And it's also foreshadowing the apostasy that happens when all of the apostles are eventually taken from the earth. So these wolves enter in among the people. Now we don't hear anything else after that. However, this is where the book of Mormon explains to us what happens next. Nephi explains that all mankind were in a lost and fallen state and that the mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil, which blind the eyes and harden the hearts and leadeth them away into broad roads and they perish and are lost. Nephi references an evil entity that arises. Now he references this entity with several different names, the great and abominable, the horrible of the earth, Babylon, the great, the harlot, the church of the devil. Now, some people misunderstand this, and they look at the Babel and the Great and the Church of the Devil, as explained in Nephi's account, and they assume that that is anyone who belongs to God is one church, and anyone who belongs to the devil is another church. That is the one all-sweeping idea that Nephi explains. However, Nephi goes from explaining this in this context to then explaining that there is a specific entity that he gives details on that will arise after all the apostles are killed. And these are some references that he says. And then I saw among the nations of the Gentiles, the formation of a great church. The angel said unto me, behold, the formation of a church, which is most abominable above all other churches, which layeth the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them and blindeth them down and yoketh them with the yoke of iron and bringeth them down into captivity. Then it came to pass that I beheld the great and abominable church. And I saw the devil that he was the founder of it. And I saw gold and silver and silks and scarlets and fine twin linen and all manner of precious clothing. And I saw many harlots. And it came to pass in that day that there shall be churches built up that shall say, come unto me for your money. You shall be forgiven of your sins. So, There's a a dramatic difference between the all sweeping view of anyone who's truly seeking Christ as Christ's church and anyone who is of the flesh and, and seeking evil is Satan's church. Nephi gives details of a specific church that arises. And this specific church seeks for power of the people by withholding truth from them. Its foundation is the devil and is the whore of all the earth. It would pervert the scriptures that were entrusted to the people, which we know is the Bible. So the hands of the great and abominable church are which after which are the many plain and precious things are taken away from the book. So this is a very specific detail after uh, the book goes forth in truth, many plain and precious things are taken away from the book by a specific entity or a specific church. So why is Nephi giving us these particular details? What is the point of this? Why not just look at this in the grand sweeping view of, Oh, um, it's good or bad. Well, this prophesying, this prophecy and warning regarding this powerful entity 
These details allow us when we read that prophecy to identify it and know when these things are beginning to happen in our day. This is a very important prophecy. This particular entity, again, just to sweep through here, comes into great power, changes the Bible, kills the saints, controls knowledge, commits whoredoms, has a vast amount of wealth and power, pays for forgiveness or has people pay for forgiveness and tortures and kills and put places an iron yoke upon the saints of God. What entity can we assume would match up to all of these after the martyrdom of the apostles? Now, this is very interesting because people all throughout history have killed, tortured, maimed, abused good people, especially saints and Christians of God. But none of them, no government, no evil tyrant matches up to all of these and spans what entity spans the time of emperor empires and churches and dynasties and kingdoms and principalities. There's only one. There's only one group. That is not just a government, is not just as a monarchy, is not just a religion, but completely encapsulates all of those and outlives and outspans all empires and all kingdoms and all governments of all time. And that is the one that we are going to discuss. So Nephi, when he speaks um, typologically, He's talking about two different types, but when he speaks historically, he is going in and identifying all of these different churches. And this church starts around the early 300s. We know that the apostles all said, keep true to the scriptures because wolves are already here trying to rip everything apart. And this is where creeds come in. You've got the Apostolic Creed, Nicene Creeds, which are a couple different creeds, Athanasian Creeds, Chalcedonian Creeds. All of these creeds, and there's many more than just this, place specific beliefs to the Christian religion and uh, laws and rules that Christians must abide by to then allow this church to punish the people if they do not abide by them. And it says here, after the Gentiles do stumble exceedingly because the most plain and precious parts of the gospel land, which have been taken and kept back by this church, these creeds cause many people to stumble. And this, these creeds allow people to be tortured and abused based off of being tried against them. And that's where the inquisitions come in. They were, they, these inquisitions caused by this great entity or great and abominable church specifically slays the saints of God, tortures them, bindeth them down and yoketh them with the yoke of iron and bringeth them down into captivity. Um, because of this, the creeds that were set up, they are now able to try people against the creeds. And these heresies supposedly by these uh, tried against these people are what kill the majority of those that are trying to follow Christ in this time frame, it's really important to understand these inquisitions. People were killed for not believing in infant baptisms. People were killed for believing Christ is the head of the church. And these were horrific. The amount of torture, uh, abuse is much torture that could possibly be uh, placed upon a human body before they died was, was exacerbated upon these innocent saints. They also had control over the Bible. Um, this was another very important part that Nephi points out. Okay. So Nephi makes it clear that they were going to have full control over the Bible and that they were going to change many things in the Bible. So the decree of the council of Tolos says we prohibit also that the lady should be permitted to have the books of the old or new Testament, but we most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. What a lot of people don't realize is that people didn't have Christianity the way we have it today. Those who wanted to be under this great a uh, bondwell church that was formed 300 years after Christ's death, they didn't get to read the scriptures. And when they went to church, they didn't hear the leaders of their church read the scriptures. They heard them in Latin. Most people couldn't read back then. Most people didn't know Latin back then. So you knew nothing about the doctrine, the gospel of Christ. They, they, this evil entity kept the people under their control by keeping the doctrine away from them. And again, here, the ruling of the Council of Tarragona in 1234 said, no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments in the Romance language. And if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after promulgation of this decree so that they may be burned. Not only were the books destroyed and any Bibles or any copies of anything destroyed, but the people who had them were also 
tortured and abused. And they wanted to find out who was creating these books. And so they would torture people in horrific ways. They'd bring their children, torture their children. They'd kill their extended families in front of them to get them to tell where they were getting these copies. So not only were the copies burned and destroyed, but the people themselves were burned and destroyed. And this is where we're going to go into really quickly some of the saints that Nephi specifically talks about. Nephi says these saints tried everything they could to teach and and express the doctrine of Christ as exhibited originally in the scriptures, but that this evil entity would go in and kill those saints and hunt them down. Uh, specifically, Waldo was French. He was a traveling um, merchant, and he had an incredible experience that allowed him to come to God. He gave up everything he had. He gave it all to the poor. He was very wealthy. And then he made copies of the new Testament himself. And he taught that he just traveled, walk, walked around Lyon and he taught the, the doctrine. Many people heard what he taught. They also gave up everything they had and they went and started teaching. This was a huge issue with the Catholic church because no one had the scriptures and these people were teaching the true doctrines that Christ had taught. And they could not have that. They excommunicated him, which according to the Catholic church was a huge deal. It meant you were going right to hell because the Catholic church is, it was believed to be Christ on the earth. The Pope was Christ on the earth and he still is. That's what they say. He is Christ incarnate. So if he doesn't have your say, then you're going to hell and there's no saving you from that. So basically, eventually these people were hunted down to the extent that they had to hide in the Alps and the, the mountains and the Northern Italy. And um, for generations, these people were slaughtered and murdered. I mean, entire towns, hundreds to thousands of people. Now, when it was gone back over the number of people that were killed by this great Nabonimal church or Roman Catholic church or Roman empire um, that is related to Christianity, it was found that over 50 million people could be documentedly proven to be killed based on the, the vast number of towns and cities that were completely obliterated by them. Um, we believe the number is much higher though. And so 50 million people uh, that were Christians or Jews or others that were slaughtered. Now there was two specific entities. I just want to say that happened as uh, while these people are hiding in the Alps, many of these bishops would come in due to the decrees of the popes to shut down anyone who disagreed with their beliefs or religions in Christ. Um, these families would hide and run up to the mountains to save themselves. And many times either they froze to death, uh, the soldiers would follow them up the mountain, throw them off. They would tear the children apart limb from limb by sheer strength. They, it's, there was some accounts where they caused the fathers to watch the murder of the babies. And then they forced the fathers to wear body parts of the children as they marched them to their death. Horrific, horrific things happen. Anybody who was alive, who made it through any of this torture or survived when they were thrown off, anything, they were burned alive. Burning alive was the number one thing the church did, burned at the stake. That's where the witches came from being burned at the stake. The book on witches was written by uh, the, the popes and also the, um, the first book on uh, proper torture etiquette was put out by the church so people could torture as as efficiently as possible and as painfully as possible. So this is a very evil entity that abused and killed these saints that were just striving to follow Christ. Then you've got John Wycliffe. Uh, this was really important. Also, thankfully, Wycliffe was able to escape to a large extent the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. They put out five palpable decrees against him, trying to shut him up. They did not want him making copies. He made copies of the test, the Bible from the Latin, and he had it handwritten. Um, hundreds of copies himself, his entire life was dedicated to this, to get it to as many people as possible. He taught that the Pope was the antichrist of their time. And that he literally sat, the papal throne was literally the throne of Satan on the earth. And that's what they understood. Um, it, it, the, all of these teachings didn't endear him necessarily to the church, of course, but what happened was when he did die of a stroke, uh, Pope Gregory, I believe, came in and um, exhumed his body about 30 years after he died, dug it up, burned him at the stake and scattered his ashes to ensure he could never be have a resurrection. He could never be unified. Um, he could never come back to um, be uh, come back to any kind of salvation. 
Okay. So that was really, really important that, that they did that to him even after he died. And then John Huss. John Huss was affected by all the writings of Tinsdale or, or of um, Wycliffe and also of the Waldensians, Peter. And he lived on an island after he got making copies of the Bible for people to have. Many of the people that came to him, they gave up their entire lives. They gave all their energy to making copies and they sent these copies all throughout the world. Now he, they, all of his people were hunted down and killed. It was known if you were a Hussite or a Waldensian, that's what they called them, um, to just kill on sight. You, you torture them and you burn them at the stake. Now, John Huss, this is where you get um, don't cook the goose. Hus means goose. And he prophesied while he was burning, burned alive that you may be able to silence me, but a hundred years from now, a swan will come that you will not be able to silence. And that is where he is referencing uh, um, Luther, Martin Luther. And Luther, of course, comes and has the 95 thesis that he nails up of the evils that the church has done. So John was killed by the Roman Catholic Church for the heresy. The, the legal reason why he was killed is he proclaimed that Christ is the head of the church and the salvation is in Christ alone and that people did not need the Roman Catholic Church to be saved. They simply needed to seek Christ and receive through personal revelation his word. And Nephi says, and all this they have done that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, that they may blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. And that's what's happened. Most of these people that were killing them did not have the scriptures. They simply believed their religious leaders were right and they were following through with these horrible executions. What we understand is when Christ comes into play here, the revelation tells us that the, the true church goes into the wilderness and that there's a main entity in charge. And that's what's happened. The main entity we understand of Christianity is not the true Christianity. The true Christians that followed Christ would always be tortured. They would always be abused. They would always be running off into the wilderness. And that's what all of these Christians around here that we read about that were truly trying to follow Christ, they're in the wilderness. They're being tortured and abused. But this main entity of Christianity that everyone looks to as what Christianity is after Christ, this is the false Christianity. These are the, the, the people that come into play that abuse and torture the true Christians that Nephi sees. Tinsdale was really important. He, even in his last words were, as he looks up, he says, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. He translated for the first time, the Bible from the Greek. And this is when we also had the printing press. So he made a huge impact on people's ability to read the word of God, because he was able to go in and not only translate it from the Latin, which had a, a few different errors and things, but he translated from the Greek, the more correct version. And he got these copies out to thousands and thousands of people anywhere that they could find his books, which were shared in secret places everywhere. They burned them in mass, but they did hunt down Tinsdale. Eventually they tied him to a stake, uh, choked him and burned him. It was really horrific. So these martyrs, before we go into indulgences, are really important to realize we can't even touch on Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was burned alive because they claimed she wore men's clothes at one point. And then, of course, if um, a few years later, they said, okay, we were wrong. She didn't really do that. Okay. And then they claim her as a saint when they murdered her. This is a very, very evil entity that matches up to murdering and abusing the saints that are truly trying to find follow Christ. Now we get into indulgences. Indulgences start around 1095, but a lot of them can, happened beforehand, but officially the palpals, um, bowls that were put out show that they start around that time. Yea, and it will come a day when there shall be churches built up that they shall say, come unto me and for your money you shall be forgiven of your sins. So to understand what a, an indulgence is, is they believe that, um, Pope Paul the sixth said, an indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly dep deposed gains under certain defined conditions through the church's help as a minister of redemption when she dispenses and applies that authority. Holy moly, that's a mouthful. Basically, it just said, okay, Christ did die for your sins, so that's cool, but um you're, you're forgiven of it, but you're still going to be punished. And if me, the church, they believe that the church must speak for you. That's what's taught in Catholicism. The church and the Pope must say, you can get into heaven. No one else. There's no other way to get in. And so if the church doesn't step up and speak on your behalf, then, which is an indulgence, well, then you're going to suffer in purgatory being punished for all of your sins. You were forgiven, but you're still going to be punished. 
that sounds pretty horrible. And, and so that, that was the understanding that you could not get to heaven. You cannot get to Christ except for the church. And then also they teach, you cannot pray to Christ or heavenly father. You cannot get to Christ except through Mary. So that's why you see um, images of Mary everywhere and the name of Mary and the lady of the whatever, because uh, they depict Christ as a baby, as though he's reliant on Mary and everything goes through her. Everyone prays through her. Everyone does everything through her. The Pope kisses her feet, all of that stuff. So lots of of twisted doctrines of men here that have come out of this. And as far as the indulgences are concerned, when they started coming out, you know, you commit adultery, they had traveling bishops that would go around and say, who committed these sins? People come up, give them money. You get a slide of paper that was rolled up and then say, here, you're forgiven. Hold on to this. It just shows you're forgiven. Or sometimes they even um, said, well, here's an indulgence for the next 500 days. So the next 500 days, anything you did, you were already forgiven for this is all well documented. Paying for uh, forgiveness was huge. Now the wealth in fine linen, and Nephi says, I saw gold, silver, silks, and scarlets, and fine twine linen, and all manner of precious clothing. And I saw many harlots. What's really interesting here is you can see, you can look up and see that the a lot of the nuns and other groups followed a lot of the pagan worshiping, where they had the priest and the and the priestesses. Um, fornicating. And so you have a lot of that, um, all sorts of corruption for hundreds of years where basically the nun homes were actually harlot houses. And that's what Nephi saw. And then the there's no other churches that dress the way the Catholic um, Catholics do and all the breakoffs from the Catholics, these robes and the linens and the priesthoods. Remember in the temple, Satan says, well, these are a sign of my priesthoods, right? The linens are very, very important to this group. So religious freedoms and reformations, many more people came, many more people tried to, to change things. The Here's a quote here, the right baptism of Christ, which is preceded by teaching and oral confession of faith, I teach and say that infant baptism is a robbery of the right of baptism of Christ. And these people were all killed. And we understand right here in Moroni 8, it says little children, um, the, those that say that little children need baptism. Um, deny the mercies of Christ and set it not the redemption. If the things that the Book of Mormon prophets taught, if they had existed during this church, they all would have been martyred and killed. If Joseph Smith had not been separated, which is why God moved upon a man, a Gentile, to set up a new area for us to worship, that it couldn't have happened without Joseph Smith being separate because Joseph Smith and all the followers would have been killed under this great and abominable church. So Nephi, Nephi's account. Um, says that they taught incorrect doctrines. They had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. Nephi's detailed account regarding this particular entity shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the historical Catholic church, which is the offender. Nephi makes this very clear that after the Bible goes out from the apostles, a great church is formed and that great church does all of the things that we have just explained. And then this is where Joseph Smith comes into play. So Joseph Smith is told by Heavenly Father when he's seeking what church to join, he's specifically told they all teach incorrect doctrines and they deny the power they have. They, um, his anger is kindled against the inhabitants of the earth because of this. They, they're all professors are corrupt and that he must not join any of them. He's to told all of them are corrupt. The Methodists, the Puritan, the Anabaptists, Lutheran, Protestant, etc. All They all came from the Catholic Church. While the original people who tried to break off from it were following God, they all have become corrupt. So what does Nephi's de detail this particular entity ensuring that we know who it is and then warn us not to join them? It seems kind of silly, right? We're not joining them. We're Mormon. We're LDS. We're, we're a very separate uh, denomination. Or does he think that we're all of a sudden one day just going to con convert to Catholicism or one of these other sects? Why did these prophets who were watching us tell us specifically, do not join with them, do not unite with them. And this is the one quick focus on is that the book of revelations perfectly mirrors the Nephi's account in what he's saying. John saw the same things. He says that she's drunk with the blood of saints, meaning she's murders and kills all those who follow Christ. She's characterized with enjoyment of wealth and luxury, sexual immorality. She has dominion over all nations. And you know, this is the church that has outlived empires, governments, principalities, monarchies, everything. Her fate is consumed at the end. But Nephi's detailed account is not just a history lesson. Like John's, it's a layout for the future. 
However, Nephi and Moroni are, are different than John in that they're writing directly to us, the Latter-day Saint Church, the Mormon Church restored by Joseph Smith, and he, they have a very specific message to us. In Moroni 10.3, it says, Behold, I would exhort you that when you read these things, if it be wisdom in God that you should read them, that you would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men. And when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, eternal Father, in the name of Christ. If these things are not true, he will manifest the truth fit unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And he says, I exhort you to remember these things for the time speedily cometh that they, that you know that I lie not. He gives this example right after he tells about the destruction of the Jaredites. And then he's talking about the destruction of the Nephites. And we are about on the precipice of a destruction of another group that has been given the blessing of this, of this land. That's why we have this book. So they tell us not to unite with them. Very specifically, they tell us that something's going to happen. And that's what we're going to get into here. And again, this is the second warning in ether. O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you. Suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain. The sword of the justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction if you shall suffer these things to be. Wherefore the Lord commandeth you, when, when means it's going to happen, when you see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation because of the secret combination which shall be. For it cometh to pass that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the kingdom, the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries, and the destruction of all people. So when this happens, awake. Now, an examination of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from their understanding. So what did the early saints think about this? What did the early saints feel? What did Joseph Smith teach about this? Well, Joseph Smith lived in a time when the people, he knew the country is built on Puritans, who all these people who wanted to break off and get away from the Roman Catholic Church and its abuse and um, all the breakoffs, the, the Church of England, all these things are all breakoffs of that. So the great and abominable church, the whore, that is something that was taught regularly in the other saints, and they understood it. They knew they had come out from underneath it. And so I'm not going to go through, read the entire things. I urge you to stop this and, and read these whole quotes. But the apostate Catholics, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth, the mother's family with the Roman Catholics and prostitutes, uh, prostitutes, prost <laughs> Protestants, and all that have not had the keys of the kingdom and power thereof. Both Catholics and Protestants are nothing less than the whore of Babylon, whom the Lord denounces. All the priests who adhere to the sectarian Christian religions of the day, with all their followers, without one exception, receive their portion with the devil and his angels. Again, the old church is the mother. This is the reference to Nephi and John. There is none in all Christianism, Christianum that doeth good, no, not one. Both Catholics and Protestants are nothing less than the whore of Babylon, whom the Lord denounces as having corrupted all the earth by their fornications of wickedness, wickedness. And any person who shall be so wicked as to receive a holy ordinance of the gospel from the ministers of any of these apostate churches will be sent down to hell from them. This is very direct, very clear. You can't mince words here. This is all taught all during Joseph Smith's time period. Um, this one's really important. A great portion of the Oriental country has been preserved from the grossest idolatry and wickedness, confusion, bloodshed, murders, cruelty, and errors in religion that have overspread the rest of the world under the name of Christianity, the mystery of antiquity. And it goes into the, the terrible things that have been done. And then it says, it is a mystery of antiquity and that has overspread a great portion of the world and has borne rule into the present day, sometimes under the name of Roman university, universality, sometimes under the name of the Greek church, and at other times under various classes and names. That's all connecting back to Rome and the church built up starting there. But when a thing professed to be holy and takes the name of Jesus Christ as its founder, the holy prophets and apostles to carry out all manner of oppression. That's what the Roman Catholic church says. They got their lineage all the way back to Christ and the apostles. That's why they claim no other church is correct because they have the lineage and all manner of idolatry and idol worship. What is idolatry and idol worship? We did a video on that. I'd urge you to look at that. All manner of priestcrafts and kingcrafts and more or less invest instigating division among nations and governments, all to carry out bloodshed, cruelty, the rack, the inquisition, and holding of men in bondage. The inquisitions that that word is only used with the Roman Catholic Church, ruling them with a red, a rod of iron. It is a mystery of antiquity calculated to deceive millions. And it has, it has deceived hundreds and hundreds of millions. And then here, the great horror of all the earth that has brought the whole earth under a lasting curse, having departed from the laws of God, changed the ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant, in consequence of which the earth is destined to be burned and few men left. There, It goes on and on. As long as, as, 
how long has this order of things existed, this dreadful apostasy, this class of people that pronounces them Zion or Christians without any of the characteristics of Zion? It has existed from, for some 16 or 17 centuries. It has spread itself and grown and gone into the four quarters of the earth, talking about the Catholic Church. And again, she is termed in other places by the same prophet, the whore of all the earth, making the nations drink the wine of the wrath of fornication. Some three centuries ago, there came out sorty, excellent men named Martin Luther, John Calvin, and many others that might be mentioned who protested against the wickedness and abomination of the church, wherein they have been educated and of which they have been members because of their protestations against the mother church. They were called Protestants. So again, the connection between these people leaving it because they realize it's wicked and evil. And even in our day, many people up to Bruce R. McConkie, Bruce R. McConkie specifically said the Roman Catholic Church specifically singled out, set apart, described and designated as being the most abominable above all the churches. What's interesting here is he was silenced for this. This was the changing time in the church when, OK, we don't talk about. No, 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 no. It's not a specific church, everybody. It's just in general. This whole idea now is taught. No, no, no. It's just in general. No one church fits into it. Everybody can be good or bad. That's what Satan wants. He wants to take away from the very clear, detailed truth that Nephi and John told us. They gave us details because, and time frames because they knew what would happen. And up until Bruce R. McConkie was regularly talked about. And then after that, a huge shift changes. We're becoming a global church. We want to get along with everybody. That's what not what Joseph Smith taught. Joseph Smith taught this. The principle is this, that men of congenial religions or other interests should separate themselves from those of adverse faith and interest and pair off. And at the bottom here, the promiscuous intermixture of heterogeneous bodies for the purpose of unity and strength is alike distant, both from pure religion and sound philosophy. Very clearly, he says, you cannot intermix. You cannot be, oh, one big happy family all under one faith. And that's not how it works. You lose your doctrine. You lose pure truth and you lose um the res restoration when you try to get along with everyone, just like the Muslim pamphlets that were being put out and that's being pushed recently is this connection to, oh, look how much we have in common, everybody. Let's not focus on what we have, um, you know, uh, that separates us. Let's focus on what brings us together. No, we were, the scriptures say, be separate, come out from among them. That's a very important key role in Zion. Joseph Smith also said, now of all the murders and abuses that have happened by this church, grief, sorrow, care under the most damning hand of murder, tyranny, oppression, supported and urged on and upheld by the influence of that spirit, which has so strongly riveted the creeds of the fathers. We know creeds of the fathers are all those creeds claim to force people who want to follow Christ to doing certain things who have inherited lies upon the hearts of the children and filled the world with confusion and has been growing stronger and stronger. And is now the very mainspring of all corruption and the whole earth groans under the weight of his iniquity. It is a iron yoke right out of the book of Mormon. And then he goes on here to say this same spirit that's affected all these things. It's, it's abusing and affecting the saints today. So at the very bottom, it says, on the earth, among all sex parties and denominations who are blinded by the subtle craftiness of men, whereby they lie in wait to deceive and only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. Therefore, that we should waste and wear out our lives in bringing to light all the hidden things of darkness wherein we know them and they are truly manifest from heaven. He's saying to stand up for what's right and call this out. We know this is evil. We know this is wrong. Look at all the people that have been murdered and slaughtered, children and orphans, and we need to be standing up for them. We need to be standing up for what is true and not just simply sitting back and worried about offended people. And then this is one of the most powerful things that most people don't even know exists is the fact that Joseph Smith set out a proclamation, a proclamation to the world long before our modern day proclamation of the world or proclamation to the family. He specified something very, very important in regard to this, all the Christians in the whole world or anyone that would claim to be Christian. And this is his message that he was told by God to proclaim to the entire world. Though your minds are yet darkened and your eyes dim of sight by the traditions, superstitions, and follies of the age imposed upon you by the palpal sea and hierarchy of Rome, the patriarch and ecclesiastical council of Constantinople, and the priesthood of the Protestant sects, the God of heaven addresses you as intelligent beings and directs you to come out from among them, that you may become the Come the elite of the kingdom, bright and shining lights in your father's house. Now let's go back up to the red portion here. Palpal C is the Pope and hierarchy. It's all the bishops and all the cardinals and everyone of Rome. We know that everything originated in Rome, that false Christianity, and that all everything traces back to there. The patriarch and ecclesiastical council, all the creeds that were 
come out of this church, all the early Christian creeds that all of our worship is under from the idols that we have to the days we worship, they all came out from a creed and they were called the ecclesiastical council. The men that came together that were appointed by these wicked people were called an ecclesiastical council and the patriarch. And then of course it says of Constantinople, we know that Constantine, when he set up his new empire and his Christianity, he set up Constantinople. And from there went a lot of these creeds originally. So Joseph Smith himself is saying by the traditions, superstitions, and follies imposed upon you by the Pope and its hierarchy, all the way back to Constantine and the evil creeds that came out of there. God is telling you, come out from among them come out from among them to be his. This is so powerful. And Joseph Smith wrote this, and then he was told he must reveal it to the world. And it wasn't revealed. He went into hiding. He was running for his life. And then after he died, these papers were found and the leaders who took over after Joseph Smith hid them away. They did not um, put out any of this information for anyone to read. So basically what you see in the scriptures is two totally separate churches. Like we explained earlier, you've got a great church that is in charge and in control and has power and money and wealth like John and Nephi saw and tortures and abuses. And then you've got another very, very small church, the very small, humble followers of Christ that are erring in small ways, but they're trying the best they can. And these people are being murdered and killed and raped and tortured. And they're in the hiding. They're always in the outskirts. They're in the wilderness. That's so important to see. The true church is never out in the open prospering. That doesn't happen until Zion and all the world is destroyed. It is always in the wilderness because this is Satan's world, right? And this is where we're going to go into some of really important points that have happened recently that some of you have heard of, but we really want to connect these points here. We talked about our huge concern for the people who suffer throughout the world. They want to relieve human suffering. We talked about the importance of religious liberty, the importance of the family, our mutual concern for the youth of the church, and the need for people to come to God, worship Him, pray to Him, and have the stability that faith in Jesus Christ will bring to their lives. We explained to this holiness that we work side by side, that we had projects with the Catholic Relief Services all over the world in over 43 countries. We, we've uh, been shoulder to shoulder as partners in trying to relieve suffering and uh, trying to help people that are struggling. We gave to him a miniature replication of Torvalds' Statue of the Christus. And he gave us a gift of his declaration on the family. What a sweet, wonderful man he is. And how fortunate the Catholic people are to have such a gracious, concerned, loving, and capable leader. For me, the moment when President Nelson actually embraced the Pope and they gave each other a hug as we left was everything. And agreed to said Spanish. He's so how important that is we're going to go to the next video we're just going to touch on something here but i've never heard anyone rave about someone in, in such a way we're going to play a shorter version of that but there's some really important things that i think that stand out here and so listen for the veneration of the pope again and then listen for the church's own acknowledgement of how important this meeting is in general The day before the temple dedication, President Nelson, along with President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, had the unique opportunity to meet with Pope Francis at the Vatican. They talked about their concern for human suffering, religious liberty, and the importance of the family. We had a most cordial, unforgettable experience with His Holiness. He was most gracious and warm and welcoming. This was the first time a president. So it was the first time a president has met with the Pope. Now that's really important because Heavenly Father had 
Joseph Smith come in a time where he could be separate. We could restore the truth that had been lost by this evil entity that has murdered and abused and killed saints for almost at that point, 1600 years. And then all the saints know this and they talk about it and they talk about how important it is to be separate. And that's where we're going to go into what president Oaks is saying here, because president Oaks said several different talks and in several different lectures that he gave as he traveled around the importance of not staying separate, but unifying along with the same messages that have been put out by the church, as far as Muslims, that we need to be one and focus on what things make us, uh, unified instead of the things that make us separate. At the recent Notre Dame Religious Liberty Summit, cool. so what can be done to prevent society's tone deafness that threatens to drown out the beautiful music of faith that can bless us all? Catholics, evangelicals, Jews, Muslims, Latter-day Saints, and other faiths must be part of a coalition of faiths that sucker, act as a sanctuary, and promulgate religious freedom across the world. So he says very clearly right there against what Joseph Smith has taught. He says that for us to protect faith, we must all be unified. Um, Catholics, evangelicals, Muslims, Jews, we all need to come together. We all need to be one. And that's the only way to protect faith. And that's very interesting because Christ teaches us not only in his time, but then in revelations and in the scriptures that we have to be separate, that the true church will be on its own in the wilderness, relying wholly on Christ, while the great and abominable church seeks out to destroy and force all others to submit under it. Very interesting. And that's what leads us to this a video right here, which speaks for itself. I'll let you watch it. But the Abrahamic family house that's being built was inspired by the document on human fraternity, which is the one world religion agreement that was signed by the Roman pontiff and the Muslim grand imam. When Pope Francis made the first ever visit by a Roman Pope to the Arabian Peninsula, the design of this one world religious center was presented to Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Islam later after their agreement, where Pope Francis approved the design. For the architects say that it's design of geometric architecture with the three cubes for the separate places of worship. It is meant to represent unity, unity of a common and mutual coexistence between the three religions, which reflect the values shared now, it's supposed to reflect the value shared by all three, and it's called the Abraham family house. So once again, if you go back to the scriptures, you know that they, the people in Christ's time said, oh, well, we don't need a Messiah. We are all one under Abraham, right? And then, of course, it says, well, they can raise up stones <laughs> unto, unto Moses or unto Abraham. They don't need you. They don't need you. And the, the point is Satan's trying to sidestep Christ and just have everybody be unified under him. This is really important because we know that in the last days through revelations and through the other prophetical writings that everything has to be unified under Satan and everything's going to come together. And Berlin has actually already been doing this. It's called a house of one that you see here. And this is where people are getting married under imams and, and, um, rabbis at the same time. And it's all about praying all under one God. This pattern happened in Rome. Also, as Rome continued to conquer more and more areas, the different pagan gods that they conquered, they unified under themselves. And eventually all these gods kind of merged into one great God that they'd all just worship under the same things happening here where they want to bring all people under one roof and that this last day's uh, scenario that's happening coincides with the government and the UN and all the other things that are happening where everyone's coming under this one realm of control and how important seeing that is in our day. And this is an, another aspect to what we're seeing now, their church's symbol, you know, the church changed their symbol um, to reflect an image of Christ walking through an ark. And and that arch that that it's depicted, those all came from somewhere. Where did they come from? Well, we're going to watch this real quick to explain it. The original was sculpted in Rome by Danish master Bertel Thorvaldsen and was completed in the early 1800s. Today, Thorvaldsen's Christus, along with the 12 apostles, graces the interior of the Church of Our Lady, the National Cathedral in Copenhagen, Denmark. 
It was here in Copenhagen that the church and its project team was granted access to these statues in order to digitally map every detail of Thorvaldsen's work. And what comes next is a remarkable blend of art and technology to recreate these masterpieces nearly 200 years later in the very country they were originally sculpted. Later in the World Report, we'll take you to the mountains of So very important to understand that the symbol that we even use, we've never used a symbol. Joseph Smith never had a cross. He never had images of Christ. He never had anything. And we've done uh, videos on idols. And so I urge you to go watch those. But there was no symbol of our church. It was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then Nelson came forward and put a symbol on it, a picture, an image he put on it. Where do we get that picture or that image? We get it from the Roman Catholic Church. We even went and we uh, mapped out digitally that image and ensured that we'd get it perfectly. And that all the Christuses that we use, all the little Christuses you can buy at LDS gift stores and Deseret Book and all of those things and all the paintings, they all come from the Catholic Church. It's theirs. And we went to them to get this image that we now use not only to represent ourselves, but we use it in our worship. Very interesting. And so DNC 33, four, and my vineyard has become corrupted every whit, and there is none which do, doth good, save it be a few. And there they err in many instances because of priestcrafts, having all corrupt minds. So the Book of Mormon's warnings in Alma 557, and now I say unto you, all you that are desirous to follow the voice of the good shepherd, come ye out from the wicked, be ye separate, and touch not their unclean things, and behold, their names shall be blotted out, and the names of the wicked shall not be numbered among the names of the righteous, that the word of God may be fulfilled, which saith, the name of the wicked shall not be mingled with the names of my people. It's very interesting that, that the three churches that are being built are being built on land, that if you were a Christian, you would be killed. That if you are a Christian, you cannot mention the name of Jesus. You cannot have a cross somewhere. You cannot have any of those things. That unifying area that the Pope has put his money and investments into with the grand imam, Muslim imam, who kills Christians and, and slices their throats, that those two people, they have placed it in a place that rejects Jesus Christ. Very important very important. And we're told to be separate. Third Nephi 15, but verily I say unto you that the father hath commanded me that I tell it unto you that ye were separated from among them because of their iniquity. Therefore it is because of their iniquity that they know not of you. The whole world is corrupt. We know the whole world is evil. The whole world is corrupt. Very few do that, which is good or are seeking to, and there God separates the good from the bad. The Book of Mormon warnings again, 2 Nephi 6, 12. This is the prophecy that we have proven to be fulfilled. And blessed are the Gentiles, for behold, if it so be that they do not unite themselves to that great and abominable church, they shall be saved. Wherefore, are you Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you. Wherefore, the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful, awful situation. When? You see these things come among you because they are among us. And it's very, very important that Satan will get what he wants. Satan's plan was to have everyone forced under him and that forced salvation. And he is worshiped as God. And so what are we seeing fulfilled here? We're seeing John's words fulfilled. We're seeing Nephi's words fulfilled. We're seeing a prophecy given to people who are reading the book of Mormon that was so important that these prophecies begin the Book of Mormon and end the Book of Mormon. And the prophet said, do not unite with them. Do not join with them. Repent and awaken to your awful state. We have united with the great and abominable church that has tortured the saints, murders millions and millions of people, controlled the Bible, took precious truths from the scriptures, and has done nothing but seek out to stop people from being able to come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to share these things with you. We urge you to go to the Lord and pray about them and come to know for yourselves and that this prophecy is fulfilled today.